So uh, I want to thank you all for joining us for our 46th annual and our first, but I'm not going to say annual because I don't want this, unfortunately, or fortunately to happen for us multiple years. But this is our virtual Oyster Festival. Um, while we're sad we're not able to, you know, serve up our favorite oysters in person, we hope that we're providing the next best thing by you know, having some programs online that help promote our history, but in this virtual format. So um, we'd like to take a minute to uh, thank our sponsors for this 2020 Oyster Festival, M&T Bank, the Friends of the York County History Center, CGA Law, Fulton Bank, York Water Company, and the W. Dale Brocker Foundation, as well as our Road Rally sponsor, the Hanover Auto Team. We're very grateful for all of the support that we've received so far. I also want to uh, thank the, the Oyster Festival Planning Committee and their efforts to provide this online programming. The Chef's Showcase, the pla from planning the road rally, getting lost in the, the far reaches of York County, offering fundraising support to make this year's um, event a, a success. And when we decided to go online, we had no idea what we were thinking was going to happen, but the entire committee really stepped up and, and uh, thought outside the box to bring these um, programs to you, and we thank them for going the extra mile. So while we're getting ready to introduce today's program, a couple Zoom features, um, we kind of go over these with many of our programs. I'm going to put everybody on mute so that um, we don't have any kind of background noise happening while Jessica's giving us the tour. Um, if you have a question, we are going to have time for questions at the end. So please use the chat feature that it's at the bottom of the screen or wherever it is on the outside of your um, Zoom panel and type in your question there and we'll be answering that at the end of the, at the, end of the tour. So now I want to introduce um, today's program. So we're going to be learning um, from the Baltimore Museum of Industry. And Jessica Sommer holds a BA in public history from Stevenson University and a master's in applied history from George Mason. She has worked at the Baltimore Museum of Industry since 2011 and has several roles, museum educator, education coordinator, and currently as education manager. She's going to give us a, a little uh, virtual tour of their museum and the, the canning industry of oysters. So I'm going to turn it over to Jessica and, and uh, get started. All right, thanks, Terry. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about Baltimore and the oyster industry that sh that reached across the entire country and including York. So it'll be some um, cool history we're gonna learn about today. Feel free if you have any questions to put them in the chat. Um, we're gonna save time at the end to ask questions, but if you come up with anything um, while I'm talking, feel free to put it in there. I'll have it up and I can um, refer refer reference it, sorry. Um, um, before we get started, uh, can you either raise your hand, give me a thumbs up, or um, use one of the Zoom reactions at the bottom um, to let me know, have you been to the Museum of Industry before in Baltimore? <laughs> Hope we have at least two folks that have, which I believe they're, they're uh, friends or members of the museum. So that's wonderful. Well, I'm really excited to show you guys a little bit about the museum today. Oh, Margaret has as well. Wonderful. Um, I'm excited to show you a little bit about our museum. This is just a taste. Um, it's going to be about 45 minutes, but it's going to be an in-depth look on the oyster and the canning industry. Um, and then hopefully when things are safer, you can come and visit us again. Um, and that would be a great opportunity to do that. We also have some public programs where we have lectures or um, public tours that uh, if you have want a group to book it or look into our public programs we have, we, we um, have some really neat things coming up if you're interested if this, if you enjoy this experience. All right, without further ado, I'm gonna share my screen. And I'm gonna start with a picture of outside the museum. And so the, if you haven't been to Baltimore, this is the outside of our museum. We're located in South Baltimore, right on the harbor. The harbor is gonna be over there. And we're right next to the Domino Sugar Factory, which is kind of to our, our back right in, um, in our frame there. And the Domino Sugar Factory is one of the last remaining um, large-scale industries in the city uh, where they 
run, they work 24 seven uh, and run three shifts throughout the day processing sugar. And so we're right next to that in good company uh, for our industry museum. Uh, this large crane that we have here is a staple of our um, campus, which is actually a, um, a whirly crane from World War II, um, II which was um, used to build ships. And it has its name because the top there turns in 360 degrees and it helped lift ships right here in Baltimore. And so this is the outside of our museum. All right, I'm going to take us inside. And this is the program we're going to be using today to take a glimpse into the museum. Um, it's our virtual tour program. You should be seeing our lobby right now with the word Baltimore there and three screens. We're going to walk right up the ramp here into our main gallery. And so this is the Canning in Baltimore Gallery. And so this building actually used to be a cannery. So you can see the floor looks quite old. Um, there's been patched with metal in some places. Some of the walls on each side here um, are the original pieces of this museum. This is the oldest part of the building. It's over 200 years old or 140 years old really. And um, this building used to be a cannery that canned and processed food. And we primarily pr um, processed oysters, but also fruits and vegetables. All right, so we're gonna head in here. Now, one of the, this industry, the canning industry in Baltimore was actually the second largest industry in the city. Um, a lot of people worked in um, the canning industry and there was a lot of different canneries throughout the city. Um, there were over 80 different cannery factories um, in, along the harbor in Baltimore, some in South Baltimore where we are, but a lot of them were across the harbor from where, um, from our location in Canton. And so canning uh, for the longest time was our second largest industry. And we had, we're a city of a great many industries. And the reason for that is because of our location. We're located on the Patapsco River, uh, which is part of the, the Inner Harbor is the part of that. And the Patapsco River leads out into the Chesapeake Bay. And from the Chesapeake Bay, you can um, get to the Atlantic Ocean and from there go anywhere else in the world. And we actually have the westernmost east port in the United, in the, on along the east coast. So you think of other big cities, industrial giant cities like New York and Boston and even um, Philadelphia, they're a little further towards the coastline than we are. We're up inside Maryland and so we actually developed a lot of industry because we had water access as well as railroad access and we were further west than a lot of the other coastal cities so we saved on time tra on travel and paying the distance of um, transporting all of our goods. And so those are some of the reasons why Baltimore developed as such an industrial giant. It was an important city in, during the Industrial Revolution in America. And um, our water access uh, was one of the things that brought us the railroad. Um, the railroad developed in Baltimore. We're the first city in the United States to have railroad. Um, the BNO Railroad started in 1828 and then grew um, not just to Ohio, but for further points west. And um, having those two things, the water access and the rail access, really allowed for um, industries to pop up. And so the canning industry, um, it can, we canned mostly oysters. And the saying goes, if you've heard about it before, is we can oysters in all the months that have R in them. And the reason for that is because the oyster season followed the winter season. And so in the months that do not have R in them, which are May through August, those are our summer months where it was really hot. So bringing oysters back from the bay could take hours. And it would be really hot during the summer in order to do that. And before refrigeration, the oysters could go bad. And so they usually gave oysters a break during the summertime, which also allowed them to um, repopulate in the bay. And they canned fruits and vegetables instead, which was also the season when those were growing. And so throughout the winter months, they could harvest ice from different rivers and lakes, as well as use the cold water, to cold weather to keep those oysters fresh coming off of that bay and bringing them back into uh, Baltimore. And they would do that by using dredging nets like this. They'd take them along the floor of the bay and gather them um, all along the floor and pick them up into the boat. And so the dredging net here, um, there was other ways of um, picking them up, but the dredging net became more um, pretty popular towards the end. They would also have really long tongs 
So very similar to a tongs that you might use in the kitchen. Um, these were just really long. They kind of looked like, like rakes, but in a tong shape. And those were able to pick up from the shallow um, uh, part, parts of the bay. You could pick up the oysters. Um, those were a lot better for the um, environmental ecosystem of the bay than the dredging nets, which could drag along the floor and really disrupt the ecosystem there. Um, harvesting oysters uh, was a huge business. They canned about 3 million oysters a year, um, and 2 million of them were sent uh, to other parts of the country and the world, and then a million stayed locally. And so they really harvested oysters to a point where they over-harvested them, and it really affected the bay because oysters are um, natural um, pure water purifiers. So they really um, clean the water and without them, it hurts the bay and hurts the other water around them, which then in turn makes it difficult for other creatures to live in. So oysters are a really fundamental part of those ecosystems. And eventually because people liked them so much, we certainly over harvested them for a long time. And um, eventually the oyster industry came to an end because there wasn't very many oysters left. And slowly by slowly, the population of oysters are growing back in Baltimore with the help of um, organizations like the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, which really um, tries hard to repopulate the oysters in our waterways. Now, once the oysters came back into, ba um, into Baltimore, they came to our, into factories like this one, and they would, the first stop would be the shucking shed. And so these are shucking stalls, and these are actually real shucking stalls right here in front of us. And it was a shucker's job, a person who opens up oysters was called a shucker. It was their job to stand in that shucking stall and shuck oysters all day. And they got paid by something called piecework. So they got paid by how much they did at work, not how, not how long they worked. And so they, it was a way of encouraging workers to work harder and faster throughout the day. And a lot of factory owners paid them that way um, in different industries as well. Um, I'm going to show you a photograph of a shucking shed. And so this job, we have two different jobs we talk about at the um, at the museum. We have skilled jobs and unskilled jobs, and it's just kind of how we um, how they were qualified in in the industries. And so skilled jobs take a long to, longer time to learn. They require education and practice and training, whereas unskilled jobs are jobs that you can learn really quickly. And so even though they sometimes are difficult um, and they are important and need to be done, they were jobs that a lot of people could learn how to do without even speaking the same language or going to school for them. And so shucking is one of those jobs. If you've ever shucked an oyster, I wouldn't say it's the easiest thing to do, but after you've watched, um, watched someone do it a few times, you can get the hang of it and start working. In the, our cannery um, in South Baltimore, the shucking, the job was actually a segregated job. And so if you take a look at this picture we have, um, this is a shucking shed and it was usually separate from the main canning factory. And um, you can see most of the people in this photograph are African-American, they're black. And so black people were generally only allowed to have certain jobs, especially in canning factories where they were only allowed to have shucking jobs. And those were jobs usually that people didn't really wanna have. And so, um, not every factory was like that, not every cannery was like that, but in our cannery, um, we know that that was a segregated job. I have another photograph to just show you the amount of oysters that, um, that, were hap that were brought into the city. And so this is a photograph of a shucker standing in front of the piles and piles of the oyster shells. And so oyster shells. And I know one of the things Terry told me about um, your location in York, that if you dig a little deeper, you guys have found oyster shells left over um, in York. And it's one of the reasons why this oyster festival has been celebrated here, because it, it was a thing that happened. And in Baltimore, it's the very same. Oysters are everywhere. You dig not even very deep near our museum, you're going to run into oyster shells. And a lot of times the oyster shells not, weren't just left over. Um, next to the building after they were used. They were also used to make roads um, and to uh, create sturdy foundations underneath buildings. And so they were there to support the ground. And a lot of roads were have oyster shell bottoms. Um, they're also, they took the kind of the mother of pearl sheen inside and made things like buttons. They reused oysters a lot in many different ways. Um, but yeah, there were lots and lots of shells 
and you can just the visual of this photograph is pretty wild now um i have a video of my colleague mike who um, does a has a demonstration of shucking and so these are not real oysters but um, these are one of the oysters we use in one of our kids programs that we have for field trips um, where we have real oyster shells but they're glued together um, with pretend beads inside representing our our oyster meat and so most times shuckers would have a sturdy but sharp knife like a shucking knife and then a glove to protect their hand holding the shell and so they stick the knife in the back of the shell where it's sensitive, twist it to open it up and collect that meat into a bucket. And so those sh shuckers got paid by how many buckets of oysters they had. Now this bucket's quite large. The buckets might not have been that big, um, but just for an example here that we have. And generally it's changed from year to year, um, but a lot of shuckers got paid. Usually if they filled around 10 to 12 buckets a day, they were pretty good shuckers and they got paid yeah, between 10 to 15 cents um, a day, which, or per bucket, which is really not that much. All right. And so we're gonna head back into the museum and shucking, once those oysters were done, they would be then brought into the museum to, I mean, into the museum, into the factory in order for them to be processed. Now, a lot of these jobs, they weren't just, they were done by children as well as adults. So a lot of children were working in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Children were working instead of going to school. And one of the reasons for that is they, their families needed money. And so in order to just get by and pay for the, the things they needed to survive, they, um, a lot of children were forced to work instead. And so I have a, a photograph here of children in a canning, in a canning factory in Baltimore. And um, you can notice there's a lot of children in this, in this um, photograph. And if you look closely, you can see in this boy's lap, in the center of our photograph here, he's holding a tray of string beans. And so he's actually um, processing the string beans by, by snipping off the ends and getting them ready to be canned. And we can tell because he's working with string beans that it's the summertime. And a good clue to that as well is because of the, they're not wearing shoes, which is kind of really common um, among children because their feet are growing so fast. They might only have one good pair of shoes a day. So they usually saved it for church or service at the end of the week. Um, and a lot of times the kids might go without shoes, but you can imagine how dangerous that would be walking around the factory. You can see those floors have a lot of items, um, just food and different, um, uh, different supplies laying there. And um, you can imagine the floors that are in our museum, they could get splinters, you could step on an oyster shell, which would be really terrible. Um, so factories were really dangerous places, but especially for children. Um, and one of the reasons they weren't, they weren't completely, um, they didn't have the shoes to wear to, the, to work. And so that brought, brought in an, Adam date, an added danger. And then once we started um, inventing machines, it became even more dangerous because children were used um, to work on the machines in different ways because their hands were small. But we'll see some uh, machines like that in a moment. Um, we have another photograph of of children working in a shucking shed. And so there's shucking shed. You can see the piles of oysters being um, taken away because those are already shucked oysters. You can see the oysters shells are open, being taken away out of the, um, from the workers working on them. And this is in a different cannery because you can see shucking wasn't just a job for black people. It depended on the cannery if it was segregated or not, um, but it was certainly always an unskilled job. And a lot of people, they can see in this photograph, they don't have the shucking stalls that um, the last one did that we have it as an example in our um, museum. Instead, folks were gathered around um, a table or a bin where there'd be the oysters that they'd be working on to then process them into the, into the um, buckets. All right. So we're going to head back in here. And we're going to take a look at this young boy that we have a little picture of right here. We like to call him Timmy for our school friends at the museum. I have a, 
a better photograph of him that I'll pull up in a moment. And so to me, his job was to carry around the cans from place to place as he worked, um, as they were getting processed. And so they'd start, the cans would start with the can makers and they would be um, cut from large sheets of tin where they would um, cut them to a certain measurement, then roll them up. And at first they soldered them together and they soldered them together with lead. Um, and a lot of times food was cooked inside the can once the um, food was already put in there and then they would cook the cans, which led to lead seeping into the food and um, could cause lead poisoning. Uh, eventually they changed the way they, they um, enclosed the cans. Then they actually used a similar um, a system where they pressed they pressed them with um, heat and it would adhere the two sides together. Um, and so Timmy's job, he would carry those trays of cans and take them where they needed to go. And you notice he also doesn't have shoes on. And he's a young boy that's probably not older than seven or eight and he's working in this factory. Um, and once the cans were made, he would take them to the ladies who'd be in charge of filling the cans. And at first it was, a, it was, always, it was generally a woman's job to take the spoonfuls of food and put them into the cans um, manually and then cover, plug the holes up on the top of the can that were left open at the top of the can. Uh, eventually they invented a machine that could do that. And so they had some people that needed to run the machine, but a lot less uh, workers were needed. And um, interestingly, when they would enclose the can, they would leave a small hole at the top for the food to be put in um, because like I said, the food was cooked inside and they would plug that hole up. And so Timmy's job was eventually replaced by a machine. Um, Baltimore gained electricity in 1881. And so once electricity came to Baltimore, we were able to start uh, inventing machines to make our lives easier and to make the work faster. And so this big machine, it's a little hard to see. I'm going to show you a video that's a little better, but this big machine behind Timmy, it has a long track that runs across the wall and then it has a small engine over here. And this is called a vertical conveyor belt and it basically did Timmy's job for him. It took the cans and, and took them, um, traveled them to each of the different stations they needed to be processed. All right, and I'm going to share my video, and it's a little loud, so just to prepare your ears, um, I'm also not going to be able to talk over it, so um, I'll have let you guys watch it, and then I'll explain what was happening. And so that's the part with the small engine, and we're showing the track. And so how the machine works is the, the cans are sent into to be taken by the belt um, from a little ramp. And so this machine would still need, would still need some staff members to work it. But um, once the cans were, were fed into the ramp, they, um, the belt would take them up to the top and gra gravity would take care of the rest as it, the cans fell along the track there. We have the track made so it goes in a circle so we can demonstrate this machine at the museum but um, in the factory the track would lead to the different stations and take the cans where they needed to go um, and so as technology started to increase and machines started to be invented um, people lost their jobs but we still always needed workers to to operate those machines. Now next to Timmy, we have a filler machine. So like I said before, it was a lady's job to manually fill the cans full of food. Then this machine um, was invented and this was per, um, specifically for filling cans up with tomatoes. The bronze piece here at the top is a big funnel and so the tomatoes were dumped into the funnel there and um, as the cans were pushed through the center piece here, um, they would fill a specific amount of, can of tomatoes into the cans. I actually cannot show you how this machine works because it runs off a separate engine. And so this 
wheel here would then be connected, would have a belt that would connect to a separate engine, and that's how the machine would run. And actually one of our galleries is focused on a machine shop and it's all belt driven machine shop where it um, runs off of one drive shaft that's connected to um, an engine. And so a lot of machines were run that way so you could uh, run them all at once off of either one source of power. All right, and you can check out the, the neat photograph behind Timmy here, which is of ladies filling cans with food. Now after the cans were filled, they would be then taken to be cooked and so the food was cooked inside the cans we have a steamer retort right here um, this was invented in baltimore by the shriver brothers in 1874 and um, it it really revolutionized how cooking was done in a canning factory before this machine was invented um, they you would use big vats of hot water to cook the cans and if you've ever boiled a large pot of hot water, you know it can take some time. So you imagine a pot this large um, heating up oh, it would take quite a lot of time. And so they would put trays of cans in there um, and cook it for hours. But without being able to see the food, it's hard to know um, if all of it was cooked. And so um, what they would do is they would actually leave the cans after they were finished cooking in the hot water on the shelf for a few days. And if they didn't explode from the bacteria growing inside, um, they were good to sell, which is kind of not the most efficient way uh, to cook canned, canned food. So they, in, this invention changed everything. Um, how it works, it's actually eight feet deep. It goes all the way to the bottom of our basement. It can hold five of these big trays that hold a hundred cans each. And once the cans are loaded inside, the lid is covered and it, it um, it's clamped down to secure it and there's a little bit of water inside um, to create steam and there's a heating source out on the outside and it creates steam and pressure and it cooks the cans completely every time in 30 minutes and so it's a lot faster and it was a lot more efficient than the hot water was. Um, I'm going to hop over here and we can see the gentleman working working this job. This was actually considered a semi-skilled job because you had to get paid a little bit more in order to deal with the danger of the machine um, and because it could blow up if it wasn't completely secured and it started building pressure, um, the lid could pop off and you could get hurt by hot steam. And um, it was usually a gentleman's job and was very strong in order to deal with it. They usually had um, a levy or pulley system to lower the trays into the um, pot, but it was still a lot of work to deal with. And um, so this machine is very similar to, we still use this technology today because it's very similar to uh, and like an Instapot or a pressure cooker, which is pretty wild that it was invented so long ago and we still use it. I have a, a video of the inside of our um, steamer, so you can check it out. And so we don't have, can't see the entire all the way down to the bottom because we have some can in there, but um, it's a pretty large pot. All right. We also have over in this corner a labeling machine and so this machine would label the cans before this it was a they would be labeled manually um, they would be put glue on the backs of labels and then um, would cover the can up but then this machine um, could do it instead of having so many workers uh, they would feed the cans into the machine and have the labels on the belt and it would cover the cans up uh, I can't get too close to our labels here, but the labels are always really important part of canned food. They always had the picture, the company name, as well as the name of the vegetable. And that picture is very important, especially in a time when we had a lot of people coming into this country who were immigrants and not speaking English. Um, we have this photo of this gentleman here. He is the owner of this factory. His name was Landry Beach Platt. And uh, he came from Connecticut and he came down from um, from, to Baltimore in order to build a cannery and so this cannery was actually built in right uh, after the Civil War 
1864. And originally, um, the first one burned down, and a few years later, they um, they rebuilt parts of it, um, and built it again. Uh, and one of the reasons uh, he came to Baltimore was um, it had a flourishing industry already, and so he could build build his company here. And um, after this museum uh, was a cannery for a period of time, it also um, changed to making just uh, boxes and containers. Uh, and then um, other parts of our building uh, were used to, to make acetone a pe a pe uh, for a period of time, uh, which is inter interesting. We have a, a good history of the different things that this building was, but for the longest time, it was a cannery. Uh, Landry Beach Platt here, he paid a lot of his employees um, in tokens, which was a way a lot of factory owners were able to keep kind of control of their employees to keep everything kind of in-house. Um, they paid them in tokens so they could only spend their money in the company store. And if you ever hold, heard that um, old song, I owe my life to the company store, uh, it definitely was a reality for some workers who who ended up not being paid enough to get by the things they need and building up a debt to the canning business. All right, and some of the other things we have in this gallery I didn't um, point out before. So to me, his job was to carry around those cans, but he we also have some can ranks hanging on the wall here. So if you're curious as to what they were there, another way of transporting the cans to each of the stations before the vertical conveyor belt was invented. And so you can see the demonstration, we had the one can there. Um, it was a way of keeping the cans where they needed to go. All right. And um, one of the only jobs that is still done, one of the job, only jobs that was still done by people today in the canning industry that's been revolutionized by technology and is mostly done by machines today, um, the only job done by people is shucking oysters because we have yet to invent a machine that can open those oysters up without getting shell inside the meat. And so that is a job that's still done by people. And so it's interesting to me that oysters, canned oysters were such um, a fad for such a long period of time. I guess it was the way of transporting the, that seafood to places that weren't near the water. Um, but I can't imagine eating canned oysters. I'm not the biggest fan of regular oysters, but it's interesting for such a period of time that canned oysters were the thing. People really liked them, and Baltimore is really well known for their oyster brands um, that traveled all across the world. All right, so I've been talking for a long time. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Um, and if you want to either turn your mic on or if you want to right in the chat. Um, I can also share some more places in the museum if you're curious about that too. We can kind of do a glimpse through since we have some extra time. Any thoughts from anyone? Does anybody have any questions? Sounds like you're doing a great job. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> Gave us a brief overview of the canning industry. Um, all right, well, I think since we have some time here, um, I think it'd be, we can definitely take you to see, check out some other places in the museum just to pique your interest in case you're able to visit anytime soon. Um, back past our cannery, so our, our canning gallery is what the museum used to be. And then we have different other galleries that focus on um, industries that were important to Baltimore. And I always like to say that um, a lot of museums, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of places people think of the cities that were fundamental to the growth of this country is really important as like New York or Boston or Philadelphia, but Baltimore is right up there with, with, um, with them. Um, we're really important and especially in the industrialized piece of this country. And Jane has a question. Um, what was or is the shelf life of canned oysters? Uh, that's a really great question and I'm not really sure the exact shelf life. Um, I'd imagine it would be a very similar shelf life to other canned foods, which is a number of years. It's just kind of crazy to think about seafood in a can for a number of years. But then again, we eat canned tuna and canned sardines now and um, that's usually good for a couple of years too. 
Um, but it's wild to think about oysters that way. Like I said, it's usually fresh oysters or recently cooked oysters are the things that people eat now. Um, and so this is our machine shop. So I, I mentioned that um, the belt driven machine that um, we had that uh, filled oysters. And so that's how the, these are all, all work. You can see that they're, the belts are connected to the drive shaft across the ceiling and they used to run off of a steam engine, but they're currently run off of a electric engine. Um, Jack asked how many canneries were in Baltimore and that's also a great question. And it's about 80 canneries. Um, that were located in Baltimore at one point at the high point, um, which it's just a lot all around. And they're all located around the harbor. So there are many, many factories devoted to canning in the city, which is why it was the second largest industry. All right. And so I'm going to head and feel free. We can keep asking questions as they come to you. And I'll just keep entertaining you with walks through the museum. And so this is a gallery that we recently redid. Um, not too long ago. Um, actually, I think it's going up one. This might be its start of it, the middle of the third year now, but um, this was devoted to the um, automobile and fuel industry. And it's pretty neat. This, um, it all started with uh, gas carts that were interestingly pulled by horses, but transported gas, which I always think is a little ironic and um, grew to self-serving stations, stations under the Crown um, Company. And that's what they were known for is their service. This is a 1953 Packard here. I can't get in a better look at it, um, which at one point you were able to get inside, but currently we're not open to the public, but as soon as we're able to be opened again, we have closed those doors for right now to keep the hands on items to a minimum. Um, but this is a 1953 Packard. All right, and we're going to head down the hallway into one of my favorite rooms, and we're going to check out the garment industry, which was the number one industry in Baltimore. So we're going to head into this room, and 25% at one point in the city's history worked in the garment industry, and we were devoted to men's clothing, and so that's what we were known for. Um, a lot of uh, New York was known for the women's clothing and the capital women's clothing in the country, but we remain known for men's clothing. Uh, so we started, this industry started during the Civil War um, with a standardized sizing system was developed and we started mass producing uniforms for soldiers. And then after the war, we were able to um, continue and made men's suits. We're also the hat, uh, major hat company, um, for a long time. And so this right here, this little wooden hat form um, is how they would make hats. And we actually uh, made straw hats was the number one thing we made. And so I have a photo of that straw hat that I can pull up real fast to give you a better, a better look. And so the straw hat was worn during the summertime. And so this is what Baltimore was known for. And actually these hats um, were made um, sturdy enough to last through the summer, but normally folks would have to buy a new one every year um, because they'd end up falling apart. But the straw hats is what Baltimore was known for. We're also the, num the umbrella capital of the world, which is really interesting. One of my favorite, um, I guess it's a fact, but um, it was a slogan for one of the companies is the Gans Brothers, and their slogan was born in Baltimore, but raised everywhere, uh, which is really fun. And I have a, a picture of the umbrellas that I can pull up for us. Where'd it go? Hold on one moment, folks. Um, and so the umbrella industry originally got its start, um, well, umbrellas came from Asia, from, from China, but once they came over to this country, um, they were kind of crazy at first. People were really scared of the umbrellas because they were so unusual and they didn't know what they were. Um, but Baltimore started process, um, making them and we made more than anywhere else in the country and exported them all across the world, which is pretty cool. All right, and so we're gonna, turn around and check out the printing industry, which is across the hall. One of my favorite things about our museum is a lot of the galleries 
are made to look like immersive experiences with looking like the factory that they are supposed to be. And so this is a print shop. Um, and this looks more like a workshop really than a gallery. And actually a lot of our presses are working presses. And on weekends we have volunteers that are there to run the presses. And printing was not specific and special to Baltimore. Many cities, most cities had at least one newspaper um, that they had. And Baltimore, we had multiple newspapers. This is actually one of the oldest pieces in the museum. It's an acorn press. It's from 1828. Um, it has its name because it looks like an upside down acorn. And this machine could print 200 copies in an hour and it can print up to four pages at a time. And so uh, in order to print, you have to first start with a chase. And so a chase, I'll pull up a picture, picture of what that looks like. But a chase is um, what holds our letters together. And so the individual letters are then put together and held together by pieces of wood called furniture and tightened and loosened by these little metal pieces with teeth called coins. And once that chase is made, the most tedious part of the job is done. They put that chase into the printing press um, and they could print as many as they wanted. One of my, I think my most um, important facts I think I like to share is about the, um, the way that the type was organized. So in, in the print shop, type individual letters are kept in a case. And so this is a type case. The capital letters are kept on the upper case and the smaller letters are kept on the lower case. And that's where we got those words from. That's why in school we learn about uppercase and lowercase letters and it's simply how they were organized in the print shop. All right. Head back into the museum and we'll head out and next door to our two galleries is the pharmacy. And so um, pharmacies were for a long period of time places to gather, to eat, to have film developed, to get a sweet tr um, treat and to go to get your medicine. And so a pharmacist could make that medicine for you. Um, and while you're waiting to prepare, you could have a snack. And so we have some pictures of our medicine cabinet, which is pretty neat looking. And I have a trivia question for you guys. Does anyone want to take a guess as to what is hanging in the upper corner of our, our pharmacy here? So this is our, our case, our pharmacist case with um, all of the items that the pharmacist would made to make different um, medicines. I have a better closer up picture of my question and see if I get any folks that know. Um, Caitlin guessed casts, which is a really good guess. They kind of do look like old casts, but they're not casts. Anyone else have any thoughts? This is always a fun fun question because it's really hard. <laughs> They're actually old um, pharmacy scripts. And so this pharmacist, a lot of the, the items we have in our gallery were from the Dr. Bunting. He was a local pharmacist that were donated to the museum. And his storage system was to place the old, um, his old pharmacy scripts that he wrote on pieces of, um, on a metal wire to keep. It's just a way of storing that that paper. And so these are just, it's just old paper. Um, but these are actually pharmacy pads that he used to, um, to write for his um, customers. And so um, they would have all those different ingredients there. It's one of my favorite pieces that we have in the museum because I think the old bottles, uh, I have actually a close up of the bottles that um, are really neat. All right, and so that's a close up, a little closer up of the bottles there. All right, I'm gonna go back in the museum and one last little story to share with you before we finish up. And um, that is about 
something called the Ring of Fire. And so Baltimore, one of our nicknames is that we're the city of first. A lot of things were either invented or made first in Baltimore than anywhere else in the country. And we were actually the first city to have street lights. And so the person that brought the idea and kind of the way of using gas as a light source um, was this gentleman right here. His name was Rembrandt Peel. He came from the Peel family, which is a really famous family, um, mostly known for their artwork. They were painters that painted a lot of our early important American figures um, to history. They painted a lot of their portraits. Um, and his father actually had the first museum in the country, his cabinet of curiosities in Philadelphia. Um, well, Rembrandt came to Baltimore and he wanted to have his own museum. And so he had, and the museums back then were just an assortment of really interesting and curious things. A lot of times it was um, different animals, stuffed animals and uh, different biological curiosities like uh, bugs and other natural things, as well as inventions or paintings. Um, they really tru truly were cabinets of curiosities. And one of the things he had in his museum was a ring of fire and it looked like this. And um, it used gas as a light source. And so he lit this up in his museum and attracted visitors to come and see it. And um, he helped bring together the idea of using this technology on the streets of Baltimore and having a lamp post like this one that used gas as a light source. And so it was someone's job as a lamp lighter to turn on and off the, the gas and light the, um, the street lights every evening and then again turn them off in the morning. And the early gas mains in the city were actually made out of wood. They're wooden pipes, which is kind of wild to think about. But yeah, and so um, the Baltimore Gas and Electric Company started in uh, 1817 or 1819 and um, it recently, 1817, and had its 200 year anniversary recently, um, which is pretty neat. And so the first gas city to have gas street lights. And a lot of these gas street lights eventually were replaced by electricity and a lot of them were um, purchased and taken to Disney World in Florida, where they you can actually see some Baltimore gas street lights that they have on display there. And so this is one of my other favorite places. We have the Maryland Milestone Wall um, with different things that we did first. All right. Now it was really wonderful talking to you all, and I hope you learned a little bit about Baltimore's history and that. Um, I intrigued you in order to come and visit us once we're able to do so again. Um, if we have any other final questions, feel free to put it in the chat and let me know your thoughts. Um, yeah, I think we're finished. All right, thank you so much for the presentation. It was great to see a museum from nearby. Um, I'm hoping that uh, you know, we can do partnerships like these in the future. And uh, for the York friends that have joined us, I hope you can get a chance to go down and see the Baltimore Museum of Industry when, when it reopens. Um, and for the folks that are joining us from Baltimore, um, our sites are open. So feel free to, to join us up here in, in York, um, especially our uh, Agricultural and Industrial Museum, which is very similar to the uh, Baltimore um, Museum of Industry. I saw the printing press and some of the things that were there. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I find it very interesting the, the similarities between what, what you have in Baltimore with what we have in New York. Yeah, it's really wow. interesting. And you guys are close by. Um, and there's a lot of kind of overlapping history that Pennsylvania and Maryland have with their industrial cities. And we do have a history program, a lecture on the shipbuilding industry coming up on October 22nd, 27th. It's free. So if you want to check it out, and it's, I believe, in the evening, um, but check out our website and you can register there and learn a little bit more about industries in Baltimore. All right. 
Well, thank you. And I want to thank all of you for participating in, in our virtual experience of Oyster Festival. This is um, our first time out with our programming. So um, before we sign off, though, I want to remind you we have some other programs going on the rest of this week. Um, check our website for the uh, registration. We do everything by Zoom and we can Facebook uh, live events as we get them available. So um, be sure to check out yorkhistorycenter.org for more information. If you haven't heard about it yet, um, we are offering our socially distant road rally um, as part of Oyster Festival this year, now through the end of October. So um, this road rally takes you all the way through southeastern York County, um, where you'll learn about some of the historic sites there while answering some trivia questions, take some photos, just enjoy being outside and looking at the fall colors. Registration is $25 per car, and it's a great way to support this year's Oyster Festival. Um, as a nonprofit, you know, programs like this are made possible through the generous donations of our, of our history community. And please consider making a donation to Oyster Festival at yorkcountyhistorycenter.org so um, we can bring more of, this, uh, more of these programs in the future. If no one else has any other questions, I think we'll sign off for tonight. Once again, thank you, Jessica, for the program. Um, thank we you. Appreciate Thanks for having your us. Help. Yeah, sure. And thank you again for joining us. We hope we'll, we'll be serving up oysters next year in person. Um, but until then, be safe, wash your hands, and have a great evening. Thank you.